Today on the Practical Preservation Podcast, we have Rabbit Goody with us uh, from Thistle Hill Weavers. Thank you for joining us, Rabbit. I'm glad to be here. So tell me a little bit about your background. So <laughs> I started my academic background as an anthropologist. And professionally, I've been involved in the museum field, mostly historic museums, living history museums. But my weaving career really started when I was a teenager. And um, it comes from the point of being one of the original hippies and wanting to build my own house, grow my own food and make my own clothing, all of which I've done. But once I started spinning, it was something that was not only a passion, but was innately in my DNA. I knew how to weave. I knew okay. how to spin. Nobody had to teach me. <laughs> very strange that that's interesting but i could i could see i could see that that need that or that desire to want to create things then that's really down to the basics of you know this is what you need to make fabric you know these these are right. the things that you need to be able to do so right. so you 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 worked for living history museums and then at some point i guess you decided to go out on your own and 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 actually be a weaver yeah, and actually I bounced back and forth. Okay. Um, I left Mystic Seaport, and after I'd gotten my degree in anthropology, I started a small weaving company in which I was a hand weaver, okay. and I was making cashmere and silk scarves for the New York accessory trade, mostly the men's trade. And I was very successful, but two things. One, there's a limit to how much one can weave by hand. Right. And yeah, make a living. I, I made a good living, but, you know, my body wasn't going to last forever doing that. Right. And but you only have so many hours. Right. And it, it didn't hit the historic and intellectual part of the pursuit as much. So I went back into the museum field. I'm not really wonderful at working inside of an institution <laughs> all the time. Um, and um, I, I was the curator of domestic arts. I was the textile curator for a while, but I saw a need um, for the ability to produce fabrics for museums. And I also love machinery. So it was at that point that I started buying up used equipment from mills that were going out of business. So what we right. run in our weaving business are hmm, looms that were being junked. Right from mills in the south. I hauled them up here and I repurposed them. So my husband calls what we do heavy metal weaving um, <laughs> because they are big pieces of iron right. and they are able to produce the historic textiles in a very similar way to producing them by hand and okay. yet much more efficiently. Right, right. And these were machines that people were getting rid of because they were getting out of the textile business because textile it- business in America was right. really moving yeah. elsewhere, yeah. you know, moved from New England to the South, to India, to China, to elsewhere. Right. Yeah. So these were just pieces of junk. It yeah. cost me more to bring them up here and set them up. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 So, um, well that, I, and I think that's also, um, you know, you're also keeping not just the patterns and things, um, alive you're keeping that that american made you know manufacturing also very important to me it's a trade that is really important that should never have completely left america and it hasn't i mean there are still mills in the united states but right but it yeah on that run antique equipment like we yeah. do yeah, yeah. So, okay so what types of products do you offer so because we're custom and commission mm -hmm to do almost everything that can be flat woven. So most of what we like to produce are historic interior furnishing fabrics. So upholstery fabrics, drapery fabrics, carpeting in the historic vein. But we also do something that's again unique. We do short runs. So we're able to do as little as 20 yards of a fabric. So we work with a lot of modern designers who are interested in sustainability so we work with some clothing designers. We work with um, people who are trying to develop a new sustainable fabric. Okay. And it doesn't matter to us. We don't put out anything 
in, uh, under our own name as a line of anything. Right. Our custom and commission. We also work for a lot of sheep farmers and alpaca farmers um, who have wool and alpaca. They get it spun and then we weave something out of it um, as a value added um, product that they can sell to make money farming. Right. So we'll do just about anything we're capable of. Um, we're expensive though. Right. No, no, I, I, that, that completely makes sense to me. I, the sustainable, the sustainable fabrics kind of stuck out to me is that where you're trying to, um, like the bamboos and things that you can see commercially, or is it something more cutting edge? Sometimes it's more cutting edge, okay. but there was a big move away from a cotton because mm -hmm. of the amount of water and pesticides. So tensile, right. bamboo, uh, the other um, cellulosic rayons. Um, but sometimes we're asked to do really cutting edge work in fibers that people are just beginning to develop. And uh, the real issue for me is that the most sustainable fibers are really wool, wool and alpaca. Oh, yeah. and historically, Wool did some incredible things. People don't understand in the historic setting that wool drapery filtered the air. Wool carpets balanced the temperature and the humidity in a historic house. So just getting people to even think along those lines. Right, more so natural fabrics, yeah. That, and we've always worked in natural fibers, so it was no leap for us to, you know, get further and further into that. But we also work with synthetics. Right. Well, and that makes sense to me just from the standpoint of, you know, when you look at an entire older building, typically they're built so that you, you, you know, you, you utilize the natural ventilation. And, you know, they understood how, the, how all the systems work together. So yeah. that makes sense to me that yeah. they understood that about the wool, too. <laughs> Absolutely. And wool carpeting, you can't do better. No. So do, um, ha, uh, do you want to talk to me about your process now or do you want to talk about that a little bit later? Uh, we can talk about it now. Okay, sure. Sure. So when a homeowner specifically or a architectural firm gets in touch with us, we can do everything from the research to creating fabric samples and then making appropriate fabrics and trims. We do possum and terry that goes with our fabrics. Okay. We can do trims, we can do tie backs, um, we can do construction. So we'll actually construct window treatments and then we will do installation, just okay. sort of depends on. But any place along the process that somebody wants to be, we're happy to work with them. If they only want us to weave a fabric that they have a piece of, and they say, here's the fabric. I just want this. I want it in this color. If we can do it, we will. But if somebody comes to us and says, I have an 1820 house that is moderate. Mm -hmm. What should I do with the window treatments for this room? We'll do the research for that area. We'll do inventory research, probate records. We'll give them lots of choices. And we will take it all the way to completion. Okay. As a right yeah and that 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 makes sense because different areas and different periods of of architecture would have you know different treatments and different different options that you can offer right yeah and we don't have a particular we don't have a particular style right do what's important and necessary for the client so we are entirely client driven yeah. And that, that makes sense, especially being custom like that. And that's where you have to be. Yeah. You're not, you're not creating something and saying you need to buy this. You're, you're matching what the project is. Right. So, so you mentioned somebody coming to you with like a, a piece of fabric. Is that how you find your historic patterns or do you have historic pattern books too? Yes. Um, I collect historic textiles. I was a curator in a museum and I have studied historic textiles for the past 40 years. So most museums are very happy to have me come in and look at their collections. <laughs> I'm capable of looking at a piece of cloth, doing the microscopy to find out what it's made of, mm -hmm. create, recreating the weave structure, 
But we also have lots of ephemera from weavers. Weavers kept records and weavers draft books, both manuscripts and uh, published sources. I can read a weaver's draft and I can create a fabric that hasn't been seen in 200 years. And that's my fort. I, I have that ability, that's my training. And that's what makes this business a little bit unique. Not everybody can do that. No, no, I, I agree with that. And I think that that's an important service because if uh, the, the things that people use every day are a little bit harder to always have something that's 200 years old. So because they get used and they get thrown away and people are like, oh, I don't want to keep that old stuff. <laughs> Uh, and it's and it's less I, I guess there are some things that are durable but if it's if it's in regular usage it makes it harder and and beyond a certain point all natural fibers are weaker and break down yeah and if you have a historic piece what you want is to reproduce it and not use it <laughs> right right that yeah. very very true uh so do you have i uh any notable projects oh we well we've we've had the luxury of having some incredible projects in our, in our life. I will tell you about one we just finished, which is sure. the Speaker of the House's House of Representatives chair. Oh, very. Yeah. That's very exciting. So, so there are eight chairs in the set mm -hmm. and we just, re we actually had to create from photographs, which is always an interesting thing, a fabric that doesn't exist anymore. Um, for the Speaker of the House of Representatives. So that was pretty neat. But we're working on Hyde Hall, which is in Cooperstown, New York. Mm -hmm. And it is a um, uh, Regency mansion, one of the few that are west of Albany for that period of time, built between 1817 and 1832. And we are, have done a lot of work for it already, but we're now working on the dining room drapery, which is pretty amazing. We have surviving textiles and um, we can copy those and yeah. to be able to do that is just like oh. <laughs> so exciting <laughs> but we've worked for almost all the dead presidents okay so we've done something for washington jefferson john adams uh, van buren you name the dead president and we've probably done something <laughs> um, we also do a lot of film work so we did the John Adams series. We've done Road to Perdition. Um, we also just worked on the Star Spangled Banner. Um, oh, did you? Extravaganza by um, David Copperfield. If you <laughs> Google the um, uh, flag day for this past year, 2019, he did, um, uh, he did a fun um, thing at the Smithsonian and we got to reproduce the um, the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we get to work on these really, really cool things. But any project by any person who has an interest becomes a really good project. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're all they're all outrageously fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, I think I mentioned when we were kind of preparing for our interview that I had sat through one of your seminars at the Greater Philadelphia Historic Home Show several years ago. And um, I said that one thing that I learned is like the, the drapery was supposed to cover the, the woodwork, which I never, I never realized that. So do you have any, any tips for our listeners that maybe something else that, that they might not know that, that you, that, that is like an inside Sure. I, I, and I guess what I'd say is I have two things, two sort of different things to mm -hmm. say. One is people um, who live in their homes should make their homes what they want them to be and not be constrained entirely by feeling that they have to be a museum and it has to be absolutely perfect right because we don't know what right is right we can know style we i can tell you what the popular styles were but that has nothing to do with taste because no two houses were the same no two windows are dressed the same and the choice of color and trim and pattern is entirely up to the homeowner so right. they, they breathe a sigh of relief that they don't have to hold to a silly standard just because they saw it in a museum it has to look like that well and yeah and i, I it's yeah. style but it doesn't have to look that same way right right and i think sometimes people do get caught up in that well this is this is how it should be and but 
people are the same, you know, 200 years ago and people had different styles and tastes. Not every, yeah, you're right. You walked into different houses. Everybody had different, different. Right. Yeah. Right. And what I really, part of why I started my business, part of what my intent was, was when I would go visit historic houses and museums, which I did very frequently, I'd walk in and I'd see Scala Mandre, Brunswick and Fee, Prell and Tassinari. And I could say, oh, I saw that in this house and I saw that in that house. And I saw that. <laughs> and there was a very limited number of textiles that were actually being reproduced because it was easy for those companies to do thousands of yards and sell them to 20 different historic sites. Oh, yeah. And my whole point was each site should be specific to the area, specific to the inventories and probate records, specific to things we can actually document and they should all look different. You shouldn't yeah. walk into Hyde Hall and see something that's at Colonial Williamsburg. It I agree. Have. Yeah. And that's why we are short order gourmet cooks. That's what <laughs> well, and, and there were so many differences regionally too. That, yeah. That, yeah. It doesn't make sense to just say, okay, everything's going to be the same. I, 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 I agree. And I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that you, that there's you you that, saw that need. There's also that big change between what's vernacular. Just pick it up. And hang on. Um, a, a different between vernacular styles, which are sort of the things that people do themselves. Right. And, and there is high style. And mm -hmm. let's face it, ninety percent of the people do vernacular. Right. Thing and shouldn't be doing what only the Vanderbilts or the Newport crowd or the, you know, whoever did in an urban environment. Yes. Yeah, so I agree. Relax. <laughs> relax. <laughs> I think, I think that is good advice. <laughs> so do you, um, I, I saw on your website that you have several um, publications and lectures, and I know we talked about a lot of your or a lot of the lectures are being canceled right now because of because of the um, the social distancing. But do you um, can you tell me some about some of your publications and lectures, and are they available on your website? Well, um, the um, publications that we do, I run something called the Textile History Forum, and it meets every couple of years and publishes papers. And yes, those are published, and I have copies of them here, and people can. Okay. get them and they're they're very interesting they're very diverse and they're online in terms of uh you know you can order a year that i still have some copies mm -hmm. um i'm at this point starting to um skype and zoom um lectures for um weavers guilds and um and other groups which i've never done before you know technology is a good thing right <laughs> And I'm also working on my book on um, uh, identifying and dating everyday textiles in America from 1650 to 1840. And um, yeah, that's getting closer to actually being um, a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's me, sort of given me more opportunity. But um, people can always contact me. One of the things I've done, I've been researching historic textiles for 40 years. I have it all digitized. And if oh, that's very forward thinking. Data, it's just raw data. It's newspaper articles, weavers' advertisements, mm -hmm. inventories, probate records. It's everything that I have collected as research. And if you send me a thumb drive and 10 bucks, I'll put it on your thumb drive and you can do what you want with it. I don't want my research to just sit here. Right. And do not, it's raw data, though. I mean, there's no, I, I have drawn no conclusions. It's just data. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the information. Data. Yeah. It's just interesting data. Yeah. Yeah. But that, so. that's very forward thinking. So, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to share that, that I missed in our? Um, I think probably. Um, no. Um, oh, yeah. Well, we did talk a little bit about the fact that um, the trim on windows, oh, the yes. woodwork, sort of gets covered, right? Mm -hmm. And think about, I know it's in many homes, it's quite decorative, but think about it as 
wearing lace underwear. <laughs> that it should be maybe peeking out at times, but you sure don't want to go around with your fancy lingerie showing 100% of the time. <laughs> Just stick it out. Yeah. Right. Window treatments are the formal gown that right. you put on the window. And the woodwork, the architraves, really are the lingerie that occasionally you see a tiny bit of, but you shouldn't have it exposed. So most modern people put window treatments way too low. Right. And they put it on the woodwork or inside the window. Right. And then right. all this woodwork showing. And that's sort of, to me, um, in the same way that historically, men wouldn't be caught in their shirt sleeves. Maybe out in the field they would be, but right. they would have a waistcoat or their vest or their jacket on. And, and you would, you, sh shirt sleeves are under clothing. Yeah. They're not, you know, historically. Yeah. So you've got to think not 20th century. You have to really think historically if you're going to do a period installation. Yeah, yeah. And, and the and, other thing is, -wall, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. The other thing is wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. Carpet mm -hmm. it up till the Civil War, really. Yeah. in parlors and halls and uh, in bedrooms even sometimes, bed chambers, was wall to wall, woven in strips, sewn together and tacked around the perimeter of the room. Mm -hmm. Wool carpeting was sometimes rolled up in the summer and grass matting put down and then the carpet reinstalled in the winter, but it's not area rugs. Right. And you put druggets or other pieces of carpet over the top in the walkways. You know how in museums they used to put plastic runners down yes. when it was muddy? Well, people did that in the past, except they used other layers of carpet. Right, to protect the, the to, so you didn't wear it out. Yeah. Right. Carpet is really expensive. Yeah. So you'll see a wall to wall ingrain carpet with a Venetian carpet as a walkway. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing are slip covers. Nobody would ever have their show furniture, the show cover on their upholstered furniture out there in public on a regular basis. They always have loose covers or what we call slip covers today until company came and then you whisk that off. <laughs> beautiful show, but fabric was expensive. So right. Expensive. Us, but it was expensive and people yeah. knew how to preserve it and protect it right so, it, re it reminds me of people who who don't let you in the in the uh, in the good living room you know <laughs> and there's plastic on everything you don't go in the kids don't play in the living room right <laughs> it still had slip covers yes so yeah well very good well thank you thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us how should our listeners contact you the best way is through our website. Um, there's an email address there. And then if they have images to send me later, they can, um, we can get in touch. Um, but email works really well. Okay. And then um, our, I will tell you our online store is terrible. Um, okay. But the two, the two products that um, may make sense, um, one is our window treatment book, which has window treatments that we've done and then a piece of appropriate fabric for whatever that window treatment is. So you can order those online. And then the other fun thing is we do a really big sample pack. It has three samples of every type of fabric, including carpet that we weave. And um, that's sort of a fun thing because it gives you a pretty good range of what we yeah. can do. Yeah. And it also gives you how to get in better in touch with us and what we do for homeowners and what we do for designers. Okay, very good. And I know you mentioned that you're starting a YouTube channel. So yes. is that on your website also? Uh, not yet. Okay. It's the, it's the Textile History Forum Collection. Okay. And what I'm doing is I'm just doing very brief little videos uh, of my textile collection, which is mostly American coverlets, uh, woven coverlets. But um, there are some bed hanging pieces and there are some clothing pieces, but there, I have this huge collection and I really want to share the historic information with as many people as care to. And it went live today. So okay. Very it's good. Up there. <laughs> it's out in the world. <laughs> it's not meant to be particularly pretty or special. It's just I have all these coverlets. I have all this information. Yeah. If people want it, I'm happy to share it. 
and that's that's you know we're very good that way yeah that's how i feel about about our knowledge too i i want to i want to share it with as many people as we can so that you know everybody can learn job of it yeah um and you do these podcasts which are wonderful yes thank you yeah. So, well, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time. And and I'm very thrilled to be a part of your system. Okay. So. Thank you.